loading uh, and we're going to be live in a couple of seconds. And it's going to be live on uh, the YouTube. On YouTube. Yeah, exactly. Uh -huh. Okay. We should be live. It's going to be live on the YouTube. On YouTube. On YouTube. Yeah, exactly. I think we are live. Yes. Okay. Then uh, I'll just use the usual phrase in Italian this time because uh, I have to thank uh, Giulia Nichini. Uh, siamo live. Um, so, first of all, Thanks to Steve for being here. It's a real pleasure and thanks to Andrea. Um, so for anyone who doesn't know Steve, he's a now retired serial entrepreneur. Uh, he got eight startups uh, up until 1999. And then he got basically into teaching and uh, basically going through uh, and helping others becoming as successful as he was with uh, uh, diverse programs like uh, the Lean Startup and Lean Launchpad uh, classes and hacking for defense. Um, now leave the floor to Andrea, who can briefly introduce himself as well, and then we'll just go straight to the interview. Well, so thanks anyone for being everyone for being with us. It's a great honor. Uh, my, so my name is Andrea Gilli, I'm senior researcher at the NATO Defense College. So thanks to Filippo for his push and drive for having again a great guest and thanks to Steve for being with us. We know he has a very busy schedule. So it's really an honor and I'm not just uh, saying this for the sake of. I want to say a few words. I mean, uh, if you go on YouTube and you look for some videos uh, about Steve, you have an impression of a person who has been everywhere and has done everything. And I mentioned a few things, if I remember correctly, uh, you were born in New York City, Lower East Side or something like that, I remember, with a family from Eastern Europe. And then you moved for medical school. But then I guess, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, you got bored and you somehow landed in Florida working for the Air Force. And then from Florida, you went to Vietnam where you were repairing aircraft during the war in Vietnam. And then the war was over and you basically thought, what should I do about these after especially having worked all, all these electronics? And that's how you ended up in the Silicon Valley. And then your career in a way started or uh, and, uh, progressed further. So these are some of the things. Maybe can you tell us what are the most remarkable parts of your uh, exceptional career path that you think uh, are worth that uh, any, any young student that uh, can be inspired by you should, should probably look at? So thanks for the introduction. That's a much better story than when I tell it. So uh, I, I kind of like your version. <laughs> it's, 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 it's almost recognizable of my career. <laughs> but, you know, I had, a, I had, as you mentioned, a couple of careers. I uh, spent four years in the Air Force and then um, did eight startups in Silicon Valley in 20 years and um, then became an educator, uh, now teaching at Stanford, Innovation Fellow at Columbia. Um, and uh, helped co-create something called the Lean Startup Movement with uh, Eric Reese and Alexander Osterwalder. And then in between that, I was a public official in California uh, as well. So I spent uh, six and a half years doing that. So uh, I had bookers and multiple uh, ventures. And I think the common thread for me, which students should think about is I get my thumb and saw where the world would take me. Um, and, uh, and for me, that was a way I lived my life is that, um, I saw lots of people who got old. That is when I was young, I observed that when people got old, a lot of them kept saying, I could have, I should have, I, you know, if I only had done X or Y, and I was never going to live my life that way. I was never going to look backwards and, and have a set of regrets, um, and uh, so my life has been an adventure, I guess, uh, because as I said, uh, not only did I stick out my thumb, um, I showed up a lot. I, I kind of, 80% of success is just showing up when other people are either too busy or won't wait or, or won't put themselves in position to do that. Um, 
and, uh, and and that's not a description of being fearless. That's a description of someone being curious. Um, and so I think a number one trait of great entrepreneurs is being curious about everything um, and wanting to learn new things. And if you are, that kind of passion for learning and discovery will will take you into a lot of places. You know, and and then I'll then I'll see if I answered your question. It's pretty hard to predict a career trying to look forward and forward cast. You know, it's almost obvious when you look backwards how the pieces made sense. Um, but but connecting the dots, you know, as you're sitting in one moment at a time is pretty hard um, because you never know where the world is going to take you. But when you look back, those dots actually make sense. As though I took this class or I did this or I settled into this lecture, I was even in the wrong lecture room. But I found that more interesting than my major. Those things, those things happen for people who know how to take advantage of them. Can I ask um, you? Did I answer your question? Yeah, but can I ask you a qualification? What do you mean by exactly by showing up? And eventually, if you can give us a couple of examples. Um, you know, um, I'll, I'll give you two funny examples, maybe not directly related to students, but. When I was in the military in Southeast Asia, I got to an air base and I was assigned to the, the worst job one could get, which was working on what was called the flight line. It was 110 degrees outside. And I had to literally take boxes in and out of the airplane and bring it into the people working in the air conditioned shop who were actually repairing them. But in school, in, in technology, technical school, I was actually good at repairing them. And, and these folks needed help. And even though it wasn't my job, I volunteered to kind of after my job was done, I'd go in and help them repair the boxes, even though I was supposed to be outside. Uh, and pretty soon the person in charge of the, the shop noticed, what are you doing here? And I said, well, I'm helping them fix this stuff. And he watched me for a couple of days. And then he said, come here. And he gave me a stack of boxes that were broken. He said, let's see you fix these. And a couple hours later, I was done. And he said, huh. Well, that's interesting. I gave you the boxes that no one could repair. Um, he said, congratulations, you're now in the shop. Um, and for, well, then for the next year and a half, while other people were sweating outside, I was sitting inside an air-conditioned building. And I did that by showing up. Uh, another example is, uh, you know, I, I ended up at Stanford working inside a, a, a building at the time, which was called the Terman Engineering Building. I had no idea who this guy was, but you know, my history was kind of, I was always interested about the nature of innovation and entrepreneurship. And I realized there was no history of Silicon Valley that told about the intersection of the military and entrepreneurship. Everybody thought the Valley started with Steve Jobs or maybe before that, the Intel folks or the Fairchild Semiconductor people or, or whatever. It turned out um, the guy the building was named after, Fred Terman, was actually the father of Silicon Valley. It turned out it was the intersection of the military and um, and uh, entrepreneurship that kicked off Silicon Valley and no one had told that story. And my wife looked at me and said, well, Steve, you have to be a professional historian to kind of write the history of Silicon Valley. And I said, I'm just showing up. I'm writing the history of Silicon Valley. And it turns out if any of your, any of the viewers are interested, there's now a talk, the secret history of Silicon Valley, which is now the canonical history of how the Valley actually got started. I just showed up, no one else was there. Um, and, and there are much better historians and there's a whole bibliography of who they are on my website, but I happen to have some unique knowledge of having lived in multiple worlds of both the military world and the defense world and the entrepreneurship world. And I was curious and I showed up and the opportunity happened. And the last story is the lean startup story. Um, and this is, we'll get into some of the things we'll talk about, but in the 20th century, entrepreneurs were simply told by their investors with, who never said, I don't think these exact words, but it was what they were saying is startups, you're nothing more than smaller versions of large companies do everything a large company did. And, and I'll tell you the path later, but, but basically I showed up and said, well, wait a minute. I think this is wrong. Well, no one else showed up and was saying it was wrong or maybe a couple of people were, but I was the only one who was saying, not only is it wrong over here, but here's what we should be doing about it. Well, no one else was, everybody was just doing what their investors said. Well, the lean startup came from one guy who kind of said, 
bullshit. But, you know, the world, like, I didn't hand these rules down. You know, we've been doing them because no one had a better idea. So here's a better idea. And I showed up and, and I think for better or worse, changed the nature of how entrepreneurs at least think there's a methodology or <clears throat> at least one of me multiple methodologies to efficiently build early stage ventures. So to me, it's sticking your thumb out, showing up. And that really depends, to be fair, about the culture of your region, your country, you know, the time, et cetera, where either you're, this is extremely hard to do or your culture kind of encourages it. Just as an aside, when I came out to Silicon Valley in the 1970s, the U.S. was kind of bifurcated in culture, meaning we were kind of had a split country in terms of entrepreneurship. Um, the East Coast of the United States, as, as most of your viewers might know, was the first settled part of the country. And so it had a lot of hundreds of years, unlike Europe, which has thousands of years, but hundreds of years for us is a lot of history. In Boston, which was the home of uh, MIT and Harvard and a whole set of uh, computer startups, you know, that was the place for technology. But the culture was, boy, when you got a job, you got a job for your entire life. And, you know, at number one. And number two is, if you weren't living at home, you at least saw your parents often. And the first thing that they would ask you is, how's your job? And if you told them you were quitting your job, they hung black crepe in the window. It's like you died um, because, you know, your dad, and back then it wasn't just your father, worked for the same company for 30 years. And the notion of changing jobs was like just unheard of. Meanwhile, in the West Coast of the United States, crazy people were going to. And, and this is before the Internet. No one knew, particularly if your parents were on the East Coast of the United States, no one knew what you were doing. So you could say things are fine, but you could now be on your third startup. Or you could be living at the same time an alternate lifestyle and a personal lifestyle in San Francisco, where people went for other reasons, not only just technology. And the weather was much better on the, on the East Coast. But the major change was, in the 1970s, when the U.S. banking laws changed, and we could talk about what encouraged in investors, venture capitalists on the East Coast continued to act like bankers. But venture capitalists on the West Coast started to act like pirates, and they started to invest in crazy people. And they weren't asking, what school did you go to, or, or where was your family from, or whatever. All they cared about is were you, was your idea big enough and were you an interesting enough team to actually make something big and important? And that distinction in culture actually kicked off venture capital in the United States at scale. Um, I don't know what question I just answered, but it was fun. Well, many of the ones that we were thought to, <laughs> to ask you. So, um, um, and by the way, the woman who first pointed this out about this cultural difference in the US is a professor at Berkeley named uh, Annalise Saxinian. Um, and, uh, you know, once she explained that, it was pretty clear to me she was absolutely right. Is uh, back in the 20th century, there was huge differences in the United States about different regions. And in fact, the notion of what's called a cluster, you know, certainly an entrepreneurial cluster uh, of where not only entrepreneurs lived, but what we call risk capital, seed capital and venture capital was still in certain areas where it was okay to fail and take risks and, and raise large amounts of money. You know, that was, uh, that was Silicon Valley and Boston and uh, eventually New York had a, uh, grew into a, a, a center of excellence and San Diego for life sciences. But that's still about it for, you know, 80% of, of, of uh, uh, startups at scale, at least uh, until the pandemic hit. And by the way, my definition of an innovation cluster at scale is not only where are the entrepreneurs, because today with the internet, entrepreneurs are everywhere. In so many places in the world can you raise $100 million? Well, now we get down to maybe 10 or 15, right? The ones I mentioned in the US, maybe London pre-Brexit, we'll see what happens post-Brexit, you know, Herzl and, and uh, Israel, uh, north of Tel Aviv, um, probably three or four places in China, Northwest Beijing, Pearl River Valley, et cetera. Um, you know, 
that's what a cluster is. And the other component of a cluster is obviously great research universities, uh, but also, um, also a culture that embraces failure, not because unlike whether failure is good, for those of you who've never failed in a startup, failure sucks. Um, it's horrible. Um, <laughs> no, one, no one wants to fail. But the key point is in a cluster, we embrace failure as a sign of learning and discovery. And if you're not doing failures, you don't have an innovation cluster or an innovation culture. Um, the culture doesn't want you to fail. The culture wants you to learn as rapidly as possible. And they use the, the great examples kind of as, as a no-fail culture versus a, one that embraces it is Tesla versus the entire automobile industry or SpaceX versus the entire rocket business, you know, where one is, is no, we'll test it, we'll make sure, we'll whatever. The other is, no, 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 we're going to run as fast as we can. We don't want to fail, but we'll embrace them and, and we'll pivot. That is, we'll make changes as we learn because that's who our people are. That's the culture we build. Um, another question you didn't ask, but I thought I'd answer. Well, I mean, uh, you're doing the interview by yourself, but I guess it's fine. <laughs> <laughs> yes, <laughs> that's that's the danger of having me as a guest. Uh, so we'll, take the risk. To, we'll take the risk. You're going to have to interrupt and tell me <laughs> <laughs> and, and tell me the answer question you actually want to ask. Okay, so we've mentioned many qualities that an entrepreneur should have: sticking their thumbs out and showing up, be curious and uh, um, respect their environment uh, and their culture. Um, what are the qualities that a startup should have? You said that it should learn fast and uh, it should be able to scale up and uh, be agile. Uh, but you have uh, basically said everything um, in your Lean Startup method. And, uh, in your, um, and in your classes, you teach exactly how to do that. Also in this book right here, um, that I really suggest everyone to buy or anyone interested in entrepreneurship. Um, it's really a textbook on how to do so. Uh, can you guide us through the process and uh, maybe tell us a little bit more about the uh, method itself? Sure. So for, for those of the, the viewers who've never seen the, or heard about the Lean Startup, um, basically Lean says, look, there really is a methodology to building an early stage venture. Now, Lean Startup is one methodology. You know, I'll never claim it's the methodology, but it happens to be pretty efficient. It, it, it's based on a, a set of simple premises. It says, look, not only aren't startups smaller versions of large companies, what large companies do are what I call execute a known business model. It's a fancy word for saying, Companies got large because they know who their customers are. They know their competitors. They know what features pro uh, um, customers want. They know a whole set of things. They know some facts. Uh, but startups, startups are different. Startups aren't executing on day one, uh, though they might try to. Startups are actually searching for a business model. And what that distinction <coughs> between search and execution means is that you need a different method than just execution to do a startup. <coughs> Excuse me. We built a hundred years of tools and, and strategies for large companies out of business schools. But by the turn of the 20th century, 21st century, we had no tools um, for startups or very few of them. And the lean method basically says, well, how do we search for a series of unknowns? That is, if all we try to do is execute we tended in hindsight to spend a lot of time and money executing on a set of hypotheses that were wrong. <clears throat> so how do we actually search efficiently for, for what the facts are about customers and, and what we call product market fit, that is the features they want uh, from a product or service and, and what's the pricing and how do we do demand creation, et cetera. And, and so the lean methodology has a couple of components. One is based on the idea that, okay, there are no facts inside your building, so get the heck outside. It's pretty obvious, but at least in the startups I used to do, we'd spend a lot of time arguing with each other about what features and what, what color it should be, or you know, like what customers were, or even who the customers were, or how to price it. And, and the person with the best skills at arguing would win. Well, that's one heck of a way to build a product, but that's how we used to do it. Maybe still done today in some places. 
well, the facts are outside the building. So we needed a method to actually gather that data. And so the first step in, in the lean process is something called customer development. I, we're going to get out of the building and we're going to learn these sets of things. Um, and while we're out there, we're going to do a second thing, which is called agile development. <coughs> Excuse me. It turns out in the 20th century, the way we used to build products is what was with what was called waterfall engineering in a serial fashion, step by step. We'd specify the product, the founder would have a vision, the venture capitalist would fund it, we'd hire engineers, we'd turn the vision into a functional engineering spec, they'd lock themselves in the room and believe it or not, it took years to deliver a product, whether it was hardware or software. And we assume when we delivered it that people would want it or need it. Well, obviously we know that's wrong. But, but if we were just building the product serially, how were we gonna do anything different? Well, in the 21st century, we use agile engineering. We build the products incrementally and iteratively. <coughs> so that means as we're getting out of the building, talking to people about what they need, we can actually put things in front of them and say, so what do you think? And this thing could be a wireframe or a PowerPoint slide or a price list or something else to get some immediate feedback. And now we're actually building what we call minimum viable products. And then the last piece of lean, and there's only three, is how do we figure out what it is that we're testing? What are these hypotheses that matter to a startup? And someone named Alexander Osterwalder came up with something called the business model canvas. And in the military, uh, we use the mission model canvas, but it's a box, it's a piece of paper with nine boxes. Who are the customers? What are you building for them? How do you reach them? You know, what's the pricing or revenue model, resources, activities, partners, and costs? And those are the hypotheses you get out and test. And if you really think about it, that's basically how a startup gets built. And that's the fr a framework to start thinking about. And the book behind you, the uh, Startup Owner's Manual is one of many now stacks of literature on the lean methodology on, on how to build something. Did I answer your question, Felipe? Absolutely, yeah, absolutely. Actually, yeah. I have the other books under my computer to make it yeah. with my yeah. face. So it's, it's, it's kind of hard to believe and, and literally it's staggering, but at the turn of the 21st century, there were maybe two books and none of them, none of them are mine. I mean, there was, you know, there was crossing the chasm and I don't, and there must've been some other book, but I don't know about it. I mean, that was, that was it. All the literature about innovation and, and, and whatever were written about how to innovate inside of large corporations. Um, and the, the first book I wrote, The Four Steps of the Epiphany, actually pointed out all this stuff and stood on their shoulders, but took all that stuff and said, well, wait a minute, we need our own tools. And as I said, the thing I'm proudest of is, is that there are now hundreds of great books on lean user interface and lean whatever and lean, you know, it's great. Um, but it was a pretty lonely place a couple of decades ago when we just pointed that out. Um, now we take for granted that, well, of course, by the way, the other thing we, we take for granted is that entrepreneurs are everywhere. Well, it's not only that we have a methodology that could be used everywhere. Think about the world before AWS. That is before computing was a utility. You needed to have spend millions of dollars just to get access to computing. It's mind blowing, but we all had to buy many computers to even run our code. And by the way, we all had to develop our own code every bit of it because there was no such thing as shared open source, GitHub, Stack Exchange, everything. None of that existed. And so we were all operating in islands. And, and by the way, you know, seed funding, well, seed funding was only in innovation clusters. You had to live in London or New York or, or Silicon Valley to even get a seed round. Um, you know, entrepreneurship has been democratized. As I said, scale still requires, at least pre-COVID, access to you know, hundreds of millions of dollars in clusters, but the world's changed dramatically for an entrepreneur. But what's not changed is still countries and regions' um, receptiveness to, to innovators themselves. Um, and, uh, and that starts with the universities, um, you know, that starts with culture, with families, you know, where, where do your parents still want you to get a job? Is, do they want you to work for the government or do they want you to set out by yourself? Um, do your professors want you to you know, get a degree in economics so you could work at a bank or become a, another professor? Or are they happy if you do a finance startup? Um, so I all guess those- I really need the lean startup method and uh, 
uh, your courses in Italy then, because uh, that's definitely what's what's happening here. That's well, so you, happening here. but you have to understand it's not. Um, it just didn't appear in the United States. Um, I happened to be in the university that I mentioned the story about this professor Terman. He was the probably the first, or maybe we could argue whether MIT was doing this at the same time. But he turned Stanford into what I call an outward facing university. Most universities face inward. That is, gee, they optimize, you know, more students or more PhDs or more graduates. Their metrics are internal um, or more publications or papers or scientific advances. All that's great. But Terman kind of changed the nature of how to think about a university. Um, you know, his uh, focus, at least when he was dean of engineering and then eventually provost, think of him as COO of Stanford, he basically said, well, you know, growing our community um, is of equal value outside the university. Now, it happened to be that his interest was we were in, in the United States, a Cold War with the Soviet Union. And his interest was spinning out uh, technology companies that could actually become suppliers to our military. And to do that, he didn't want to turn Stanford into a weapons lab. He wanted to turn Silicon Valley into a giant weapons lab and succeeded. Um, but the, to do that, he needed the university to actually encourage not only students to start companies, but big idea. He would give credit to professors who were sitting on advisory boards, public boards, you know, helping coach new companies was part of your academic career. Um, that was a very rare activity in the 1950s and 60s in the U.S., It wasn't until maybe the 70s and 80s that other universities, even in the United States, started to see the value. Um, and it wasn't until Genentech went public that it actually crossed over to life sciences as well, instead of just engineering. So, so to make that observation about Italy, I'll just say it, it will take a while. It will eventually come. Um, maybe it'll take some more government incentives, or maybe it'll take a smart university president to to kind of understand that that's how they'll transform a, a, a university in Italy into a different type of institution. There are obviously other cultural and political issues about why that's harder in countries like Italy and France and others than it was in the United States um, because the way our universities were, were founded versus, I mean, Italy has the longest history of universities in the world, um, but sometimes that comes with baggage of that history of, you know, Sometimes you have to let the existing professors die before new ones could take their place with new ideas. Um, sometimes, like in the U.S., a crisis forces new ideas to have happen. So can I, I, I just want to say something on these. So I, I, I lived in San Francisco in the Bay Area for one year. And what struck me, I was living the, uh, in San Francisco, but I was commuting to the Stanford campus every day or almost. And as you know, if you use public transportation, it takes forever. What struck me about California Is, the, is that it's so similar to Italy because every public infrastructure, public service, uh, you know that probably in a lot of areas, uh, it doesn't exactly meet the expectations when you think about the Silicon Valley. To give an example to, to, our, uh, to the audience, uh, I mean, San Francisco to Stanford is something like 27 miles, it's 50 kilometers, and basically it took me something like two hours uh, to reach, which is kind of not exactly exceptional. And so when I came back to Italy was saying, look, I know a place where uh, public services are not exceptional, but still manage to have kind of a way to have the private sector work. And so that's, that was just an anecdote. But I want to, so I want to say something, uh, a couple of things related to what you were saying. That is, uh, it seems that uh, especially the, the digital revolution made uh, uh, startups uh, easier. I mean, you first spoke about uh, banking uh, regulation and change in the 70s about seed capital and venture capital. Then uh, the internet made this funding startup and uh, uh, basically reaching to customers, to potential funders easier. What is that you see is the next step, the main big thing that will dramatically or not change the startup world and entrepreneurship more generally? That's a great question, Andrea. And if I knew that, I'd be running a hedge fund. <laughs> um, but, but, but I think 
I have to tell you, I've, fortunately or unfortunately, I've lived long enough to see the words entrepreneur, startup, venture capital no longer mean the same thing and, and still evolving. And so let me point out the things I've seen in the last couple of years. And the biggest one is the fact that at least in the U.S. and I think in other areas of the world, money is almost free. Um, yeah. and, and what I mean by that is that you know, it used to be when I was an entrepreneur, a series A round, boy, if you raised $4 million, that was a lot of money. Um, you know, that's a, that's an okay seed round now. And, you know, there's now a pre-seed seed, maybe series A. And more importantly, investors are making their money on what are called SPACs, yeah. you know, and not even having to wait for an IPO. You just take a shell company public and boom, you know, you've had a liquidity event. And this is a big idea for entrepreneurs who might not care about finance other than, can I raise some money? You know, the minute, so here's a, the only thing worth writing down for anybody listening who's an entrepreneur is the following. The minute you take money from someone, their business model now becomes yours. It's a big idea. If you don't understand how your investors plan to make money, you're probably going to be the ex-CEO of the company, which means, well, you might want to change the world your investors kind of might want to change the world, but that's not their business. Their business is to figure out how to make the maximum amount of money on the money they've invested in you in the shortest period of time. And, and by the way, venture capital is not patient capital, meaning it will not wait 10 or 20 years. It will wait maybe, maybe the lifetime of their fund, um, which is typically about seven years. So, so now all of a sudden you need to be thinking about, well, how are they making money? And as I said, um, you know, for investors now, there's a different vehicle called SPACs that allow them to pull enormous amounts of money out of companies that maybe never would have had a chance to go public. You know, that might be a temporary transitory thing that people are taking advantage of in this small window of time. Um, but it has changed the nature of finance and the amount of capital. The other thing that's changed just in the last decade or so, um, is uh, it used to be that venture capital was limited by their funding from, you know, in the U.S. it was called pension funds and, you know, retirement funds and um, university um, funds. Well, nowadays, uh, you know, hedge funds and, and uh, what are called so sovereign wealth funds, um, countries are investing in venture capitalists and they're the pool of money available to invest is just huge. And so that means the scale of the number of entrepreneurs getting at least seed and early stage funding is, is probably 100x greater than when I was an entrepreneur. I don't know if anybody's actually quantified the number, but it's just huge. And more importantly, those the size of those rounds are just unbelievable. Um, so that's just changed dramatically. Um, but it still kind of depends on, you know, you know, getting customers, finding repeatable, you know, and scalable business models and, and, uh, and being able to get to scale as, as rapidly as possible. Uh, Did I answer about... your question? Oh, yeah, no, it was great. Thank you. <laughs> um, I wanted to um, go a, a little bit deeper into countries investing in startups and uh, almost acting like uh, venture capital funds. Um, surely one department that doesn't have any budget constraints uh, is the defense one in the United States. Um, so I wanted to introduce uh, the uh, Hacking for Defense program. Uh, I'll let you give a brief takeaway on what that is. Um, it's just so interesting that you teach it from such a young age and uh, in many colleges, also in classes that are not particularly um, in the uh, range of uh, military studies, uh, but it's just, I guess, so open mind, uh, so um, it opens your mind so much and broadens it uh, that it helps you become an entrepreneur and it works so well also in a department where risk is almost not acceptable, like the military one. Um, why do you think it works so well and uh, uh, what, is it, what is it exactly? Yeah, well, let's start with you asked me to be brief, which you've just discovered is an impossibility, <laughs> even on a, <laughs> on a YouTube. <laughs> but, 
But uh, so hacking for defense is kind of one of the three classes that are all kind of similar that teach the lean methodology to students. That is, if you remember the three components of lean, you know, customer development, getting out of the building, you know, agile engineering, building MVPs and using the business model canvas. Uh, so I built a class at Stanford uh, over a decade ago to kind of teach this to students. And it was just to bring in your own ideas. You're, you're going to come in as a team with an idea. And, and by the way, you're going to form the teams on, on your own time, not in my class time. And, and we'll teach you how to build a company uh, from your idea uh, all the way uh, um, uh, to the final 10 weeks. And every week, it, class is pretty simple. Um, we'll teach you one part of that business model canvas, what's a customer, what's a value proposition, et cetera. And every week, you're going to get out of the building and talk to 10 to 15 customers or regulators or partners a week and build a new MVP. And you're going to come back into class and in front of everybody, your teaching team sits in the back of the room. You're going to tell us, here's what we thought. Here's what we did. Here's what we found. Here's what we're going to do next week. And we're going to repeat that. And by the way, as you're presenting, we're throwing things at you, not physically, but verbally. We're going, well, how come you haven't thought about this? Or what are you, what are you out of your minds? And that's what they actually told you. You got thrown out of that meeting with a smile. You know, no, no. And, and so we're teaching by critiquing the teams. And then after 10 weeks, they've spoken to 100 and, uh, or 150 customers, partners, and whatever. And our final presentations aren't demo days. To me, a demo day is how smart am I on a single point of time? I want to hear a lessons learned presentation. Here's what I thought on day one. And here was my journey of how I got to week 10. Boy, that's a really interesting presentation because it tells me whether you learned anything and how fast you were in, in learning and changing. That's to set the, sets the scene for hacking for defense. Because what happened was, Literally three weeks after I taught the first class, I had blogged every class session on my website, steveblink.com. The U.S. government called and adopted the class to commercialize all science in the United States. Ten years later, we've put over 5,000 of our top scientists and researchers through it. And it's now a national program called i or the Innovation Corps. It's taught by the National Science Foundation and it's the only way you could get a, a SBIR or a commercialization grant is by taking this class. It's also taught by a couple of uh, divisions in the National Institute of Health as well. Well, fast forward to five years from that, I started talking to some friends about that the U.S. government and the Department of Defense have lots of problems. Um, but, you know, they're working with the same companies and students aren't engaged. And how do we get students engaged in national service? I realized I already had a framework to do this, but instead of students coming in or scientists coming in with their ideas, why don't we go out to the Department of Defense and our intelligence community and ask them for problems? Saying, hey, you want someone to work on these problems? We could get you students from the best universities in the country. Um, and so we started this at Stanford. We called it Hacking for Defense. And now, by the way, the first program i is now in 100 US universities taught by the National Science Foundation. Hacking for Defense, the version that, uh, that uh, Andre sat through as a mentor, is now in 47 U.S. universities, uh, graduating close to 1,000 a, a students a year now, who have learned this methodology and worked on our country's toughest problems um, that, you know, like are real to keep our nation and Western democracies uh, safe and secure in their beds. Uh, so that's Hacking for Defense. Can I, can I, so that's actually the mentor user guide, which I still have it from 2017 because I was a mentor. I just, if I can add a couple of, of short thoughts, experience from, uh, okay. from my time back then. It was really phenomenal because you had the master's students in computer science, in mechanical engineering, in electrical engineering, who had heard nothing in their life, basically about counterinsurgency, about naval operations. And they would start in the class and they were given a problem, a real problem. The U.S. Navy doesn't know how to track uh, illegal vessels bringing uh, any type of stuff uh, from South America to North America. Or we don't know how to have a sense of what's going on in some corners of Libya where ISIS is dominating. How do we bring Internet there so that people can talk with us and have a better sense? And you had these students 
who had no interest before on these issues, who not only were able to develop technological solutions to these problems, but also became experts on counterinsurgency, on, on naval operations, about military communications. And so for me, what was really striking was the fact that not only you were learning a lot of things, but while learning these things, you could also develop products. You could get out of the class and basically say, look, that's what I achieved. And basically we know from cognitive psychology that our brain works much better in these uh, direct approach uh, rather than in the typical, the boring professor teaching for two hours uh, and everybody basically checks Facebooks and then you have the class and, and so forth. For me, it was, was phenomenal. And just on the guide, I remember there's something at the beginning or the, the part on the students, don't take this class if you don't like to be criticized in public. That was the best part because <laughs> that's true. When students present, they're basically criticized. Why have you made this choice? Or what assumption were you building this uh, with this reasoning? And so it's really like uh, a thing that, that pushes you to think deeper about what you're doing. So, so Andrea, what you just pointed out, and, and thank you for the compliment, I think, uh, was that, uh, you know, the class really was architected. Uh, well, it looks like it's just kind of you get up and present and they, the, gee, the professors have it easy. They sit in the back of the room. They're making us do all the work. Yes. Um, but it's pedagogy, which is a fancy word for how the course was designed. It's actually architected to be a deeply experiential class. And that is, if you think about that's the nature of education, you can go from a, a spectrum of directed learning, here's how you add numbers, or here's how you learn how to multiply, or here's a set of facts, to completely experiential as we just throw you out and you learn stuff. The secret to this class is that it's experiential, but it's actually more like a ride at Disneyland. That is, if you've ever been on one of these rides, the ride is actually on rails. Uh, though it looks like it's completely unpredictable to you in the in the in the seat of the ride, but the designers of the ride actually knew the path you were going to go to. I was the Disneyland ride designer. I I designed a set of rails that it looks like to the students it's completely chaotic. But if you think about it, the rail is this thing which we call the business model or mission model canvas. That is. That is the continuity from week to week that the teams are actually learning. And there is a pattern that they're going through. And it's only at the last week where they have time to reflect. We actually give them a week, which we call reflection week, to put the data together in their own heads where they go, wait a minute, there is a pattern here to what we've been doing and what we learned. But it truly was a, a design process of maximizing and, and playing the psychology of what's the best way to, to have students learn. And I think we now know for those that for those that could deal with it and not everybody finds this conducive to their learning is immersion in an experiential you know class it leaves permanent imprints you know in your brain. It, it's per, you get permanently engaged in this and, and um, and I've been surprised is that after thousands of teams through this now, it turns out to be one of the most efficient ways to get, teach people the lean methodology and some of the basic things that they need to know. Think about it. Of what you just said, I'm able to turn, or, or whoever teaches this, or there's now hundreds of people teaching this class, I could turn anybody into, dom into a domain expert in 10 weeks or less, right? You live through that. And yeah, if I would have told you that before, you would have said there's no possible way I could I could teach you how to become an expert in terrorism in Libya if you don't even know where it is on a map. You know, in Italy, you probably do. But in the United States, they probably think it's in South America. Um, you know, it's, it, but but we could do that. And you you live through it. Yeah, so can I, uh, so just to contextualize a bit, I mean, when you think about, uh, I'm talking to the audience, obviously not, not to you, but when you think about Steve Jobs that understood so well the iPhone or um, uh, Elon Musk thinking about uh, SpaceX and all the, the technical technological issues, in a way you're talking about that, you no? Know? I mean, about people who understood together piece by piece about how to develop a product. Am I getting it wrong or my approximation is correct? 
So, you know, some people like Jobs and Musk have world-class intuitive skills way past normal human beings. Yeah, yeah sure. No, s- seriously. And what they do is they integrate that stuff on just a few pieces of the data. And you know what? The survivors tell the, sta- the, tell the tale. So, so they succeed on that. For the rest of us normal human beings, there needs to be some process to emulate becoming a domain expert or knowing what they know with gathering more data in a rapid period of time. And, and so I literally tell people that if, and there are people that who are, have those characteristics, don't take this class because it's a framework to teach you how to do that, that some of you might actually know how to do this instinctually. That's maybe one out of a hundred, but for the 99 others of you watching, it's exactly the best way to maximize learning in the shortest period of time. Does that? Yeah, no. So when you say, uh, I mean, there is a, a comparison between when you say go out of the beast of the office to make interviews. In a way, get out of your comfort zone because yes. it's much easier to sit in the university where you have stability, you see the same faces, you ask the same questions, rather than going random to ask. Uh, uh, any type of person, suppliers, potential customers, government government officials, new question. Obviously, this requires a certain type of uh, psychology, personality, interest, motivation. And in one of your videos, there is something that it really struck me because you said something like that: to be an entrepreneur, you your theory is that you need to be to be uh, to come from a dysfunctional family because you need in a way to get excited when there is chaos. Most people like stability, but here you're telling us a story about when chaos dominates, some people are so happy. Maybe can you elaborate a bit on that? Sure, and, and again, let me give the caveat. It's not a requirement to be from a dysfunctional family, um, but for the first time in someone's life uh, who came from one, you might find that this is the one place that you have a competitive edge. And that is for for those of you who grew up in normal families, were great, loving parents, et cetera. You knew what to expect every day. Um, A startup is kind of a shock to the system. But the people who grew up with, you know, in a crazy world where, you know, you never knew what to expect or it was abusive or something else, or people who had to travel long cultural, physical differences, distances. You came from some village in in India or China, and you made it all the way to a great university, that's also a long journey. A startup in in the first year or so is completely unpredictable. It's an NP complete problem. I mean, it's chaos. You don't know what's gonna happen the next day. And it turns out the coolest but most effective training ground for that is growing up in a dysfunctional family. The survivors of a dysfunctional I want to emphasize that not everybody survives. The ones with the right brain chemistry are capable of shutting down everything except that necessary for survival and focusing on what the objective is. That's exactly what you need as a CEO of an early stage venture. Um, And it turns out that I used to survey my students until I realized I was probably doing an illegal experiment without their consent was asking... uh, how many of you were founders? How many of you came from dysfunctional families? And the, and the statistics are just like off the charts. Um, you know, I'd say at least my informal survey is at least half. It doesn't, as I said, it doesn't mean it's a requirement. It just is more, it, it just means you've gone through that school already. Of course, the downside is the goal is to get in a startup is to turn, you know, chaos into predictable and repeatable patterns, right? But if you think about it, people come from that dysfunctional environment, don't know how to operate in repeatable and predictable environments. So they throw emotional hand grenades into their own company to keep the chaos going. Um, And and that's usually you could tell when you're working for for someone who came from a dysfunctional background, they are much more comfortable when there's chaos there. And they kind of sometimes fail in that transition to, to repeatability. Did it, did, was that the question you were asking, Andrew? Yeah, I know that that was that was very interesting. Uh, Filippo, the, the floor is yours. Oh, okay. <laughs> uh, no, I just wanted to um, elaborate a bit on this amazing Disney ride that you said you designed. 
and that's what uh, we Italians or maybe even we Europeans uh, that are so uh, adverse to risk compared to uh, people from the United States and like stability and uh, uh, definitely have uh, DNA that is not as entrepreneurial as the one from the well, United States. Well, you know, Philippe, I'm only laughing because, you know, from an American's point of view at, at a distance, watching your uh, your politics it seems to be that you love chaos in your country. Uh, so yeah. <laughs> uh, we have a very dysfunctional family in politics but uh, that right. doesn't really but, help but, in uh, and, and, great and it's, it's not a criticism it's just an observation <laughs> about which part of of the culture embraces chaos um you know this really and we keep coming using the word culture this really is what this is about You know, your country has put in a good number of laws in the last year about trying to incent, um, you know, changing some laws and whatever. And they're all good laws. And by the way, none of them were completely dumb. Someone had given this thought. But I think at the same time, and the government could actually help, is to start incenting the culture as well as incenting the rules. Um, you know, the culture is, you know, how do I give bonuses to universities that actually become outward facing? How do I start entrepreneurship classes in universities and pay professors to, you know, as a, and the government could actually put their thumb on the scale and, and, and say, okay, we engineered some of the business rules. How do we engineer the culture? Um, but, you know, the other thing is to realize that how do we get venture capitalists in Italy that understand that you're not funding banks, that's funding crazy people. Um, you know, Well, if you look at the Israeli model, they looked around when they were a socialist nation and became a startup nation by saying, well, we don't have those people. Let's bring them from across the world back into, the, back into Israel, give them some incentives to teach us, and they'll set up our incubators and then they'll leave and like, we'll have a generation of people that were trained. Well, there are Italians all over the world who would probably love to come back and who've been trained elsewhere at Stanford and other places in Silicon Valley. And give them some incentives to make some money to set up venture capital at scale, not seed founding, but, but where do you bring in capital to scale that has experience in managing risk capital? Um, so how do you start that? I mean, Milan and Rome and others have the beginnings of good clusters, but how do you get that capital scale? How do you get universities to kind of start that engine of innovation that gets taught as a, you know, as a great elective in, in every university? Um, How do you get research funded in universities that are actually um, not only incented to do basic research, but um, funded to do applied research? That is, how do we spin things out of universities? How do we do tech transfer? Um, so there are other components that, and in Italy's case, I think the government um, could be a major help here because you've already taken a step in, in recognizing that's important to your country. Um, You know, the other thing I should mention for Italians that you should be incredibly proud of and think about deeply is that accountants don't run startups. Artists do. It's a big idea. Artists run startups. The closest career to a founder is an artist. And during the Renaissance in Italy, this was the first nation to recognize that the way you train Um, artists is with an apprenticeship. And then 100, maybe 200 years ago, we realized, well, wait a minute, we should be training artists at the early possible, earliest possible age. And so we teach art appreciation, even in grade school, at the youngest age, to do two things, to make people understand their appreciation. I mean, their painting and how to make ashtrays and how to, you know, how to write stories or sing songs. We teach that for two reasons. One is to get everybody to appreciate art, how hard it is, how interesting it is to watch or listen, but to also have people at the earliest possible ages self-identify and say, well, wait a minute, I can make a career for like singing or making music or painting. That's a career. And you could discover dancing. Imagine if that's true, then we should be doing the same thing in the earliest possible ages of teaching, you know, entrepreneurship appreciation or teaching how to apprenticeship as entrepreneurs. I think Italy has, you know, the longest history in the world of, of understanding how artists get trained. You just haven't made that connection between artists and founders. Does that make sense at all? I, I, so I think, yeah, uh, Andre, you went on mute. Yeah. 
Oh, so there you are. Makes makes a lot of sense. Can I just enter quickly on on one issue? That is, uh, if well, I remember when at Hacking for Defense, there were uh, some um, uh, groups were going to meet potential customers, potential suppliers. At a certain point, you emphasize, you said, "Wait a minute, that's a saboteur, the a, a saboteur." So a person yeah. is explicitly sabotaging your idea because a competitor, because this person is against innovation, whatever. Now, what you have just said about changing the culture of Italy, not only the laws, obviously not everybody is going to be happy. I mean, uh, probably, I mean, you, I, I consider myself uh, uh, would be innovators. I've invented nothing in my life besides saying that I like innovator innovation, or actually it was a justification with my mom. To, she was complaining about my room was so messy, and I said, "You don't understand my genius. I, I'm an innovator." So, but the point is, uh, how you neutralize those who are, are going to basically oppose the changing culture you're suggesting. Because that's part of the Lean, in, uh, lean Startup uh, and uh, Launchpad methodology in a way. Yeah, so one of the things is to realize that um, people oppose things for a variety of reasons, right? They, they threaten their economic interests, check. It's about money. Or they, they threaten their authority you know, gee, I'm in charge of X and now I'll no longer be important. Or they, it threatens their security. Um, so the first thing you need to understand is, first of all, as you point out, I teach people that in almost every new venture, there are people who will oppose it and we call it saboteurs. There's a, a, ga a card game called poker. And then I don't know if you play poker in Italy, but in the United States, there's a, there's a phrase that says, if you don't know who the fool at the table is, it's you. Um, and that means if you don't know who the saboteur is, <laughs> you're going to end up at the wrong side. So one is to figure out who they are. But number two is to figure out what their motivations are. And in some cases, let's say changing culture, you could decide it's financial. So how do we provide financial incentives for the people who might be thinking they're losing money? Give them money. If university universities are afraid that you're going to be taking money from one department to another to teach entrepreneurship? No, no, no. Give them new money, not, old, not make them use old money. Because the minute you make them use existing funds, of course, no one will they'll sabotage this. If you tell them there's a bonus for doing this, well, all of a sudden you'll get new people. Or authority. No, no, no. Make, you know, make them feel like they're important or part of the decision process. That is, you could deconstruct this. In, in, when I was a young entrepreneur, I used to think you would the first way to solve a saboteur is you run them over with a, with a bulldozer, you know, except just like a cartoon, half the time they would pop up behind you in 3D and then stab you in the back. And so, so what I discovered is the first attempt in a saboteur is try to make them an ally but you have to figure out what their motivation is. And sometimes it takes extra work, but, but if you convert a saboteur into an ally, they become your most trusted you know, advocate in the world. And they will tell people, I thought this was the stupidest idea and here's why I converted to, to, this, uh, to this program. So that's how I would deal with saboteurs, Andrea. Thank you, that's fantastic. Filippo. See, um, so um, I've got a question from the public that is pretty interesting. And um, it's going back to the uh, concept of uh, the overabundance of liquidity that we talked about before. And um, Giacomo Altadonna asks if you think that this overabundance of liquidity could actually be damaging uh, innovation and uh, fueling project that, projects that otherwise would fall would fail sorry absolutely absolutely and 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 it's only because i have a, a belief which may or may not be wrong but you should just consider where this comes from is i believe if you remember me saying founders are artists i also believe there are just a limited number of artists in the world that is we could train a lot of people to play piano but there are just somebody few that have innate talent or we could train everybody to paint but very few will make masterpieces and most and by the way most people paint most of their things are not masterpieces most of them are failures but 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 there are clearly a limited number of artists we haven't reached all of them but if we take the population of the world 
your first question should be, is there an infinite number of world-class artists, even if we train them, or are there a finite number? I believe they're a finite number. And I believe the same is true for world-class founders. I believe there is a finite number of world-class founders. And, and it doesn't mean that if you're not world-class, you shouldn't get funding, but I think it's not a bell curve of distribution. I think that if you had just invested in the world-class founders and not invested in, in the long tail, you might get different returns. So I think we're going down the list. We're, we're, uh, uh, we're, we're funding people who normally wouldn't have gotten funding. Um, and, and is that good or bad for, um, for society? No, I don't think it's bad, but I think we're eventually going to stop doing that when we discover the returns aren't as good as just focusing on the world-class founders and identifying who those are. So I think that theoretically we should soon ovary, uh, we should finish uh, soonish. I would just have a, a quick question about what we started. There. So a few features of entrepreneurs, you mentioned basically being curious, uh, you mentioned being in a way uh, stubborn and being like resilient. Uh, and uh, would you name a few others? Uh, one sure, of the sure. humility, it seems, was one. Please. Yeah. Uh, no, humility is not even on, close on the list. Um, <laughs> if you're, if, 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 that might be a Finnish or, Nor, or Nordic entrepreneur, but that's not anybody I've run into. Um, but agility, tenacity, resilience, um, curiosity, passion. Um, the, and the, I don't know how else to say this, the ability to create a reality distortion field, that is the ability to convince others to, to undergo a journey that seems insane by normal standard. Um, so the ability to communicate in, in a way that, that inspires passion. Um, all those are, are components of typically what you find in a, in a world-class founder. And those in a, who were in technical areas, uh, particularly, uh, those who basically could see the future, um, what looks like a, you know, a toy on day one uh, to a founder, it's pretty clear where the, where the world is going to go. Um, so how do you see through that fog of, uh, of battle and, and understand how it plays out? Um, you know, some of these are not skills you have on day one. This is why you take these classes. This is why you kind of learn by doing. This is why you apprentice. In some cases, you just get lucky, like Facebook or others, and you hit it on your first shot. But that's not how most of these play out. That's my list. Great list. And also, uh, building on that, so what would be your suggestions to a wannabe or a young entrepreneur right now um, in, in a country like Italy, for example? Uh, what stats, apart from buying your book and doing your and uh, following your classes, uh, should he or she uh, follow? Well, to be honest, you've got to decide which path you're going to be on. I mean, number one, the, 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 you know, the cultural laws and boundaries in Italy are what they are today. And you could decide that, you know, you don't want to do that. And you're, you could either decide you're going to change the, that culture and be part of the change. Or you could decide you're going to go to other places in the world where it's already been changed. Um, and so that's a, that's a choice for entrepreneurs. But you should, not be, you should not be blind to the limitations of uh, Italian entrepreneurship culture um, and, and funding and, and, and the rest. But you should decide whether you want to operate within it, change it, or go to places where you could operate at your own speed. And, you know, my hope is that Italian entrepreneurs, along with some segment of political and academic leadership, decide that they want to move Italy faster into making this an integral part of Italian culture. Because again, I think it started, it started with artists in Italy. Um, you know, it's, Italy shouldn't be the last country to rediscover it. It should be one of the first. Um, but, but to be honest, if you don't want to go that path, and you don't want to do that, then you should just buy an airplane ticket and go to other places in the world where you don't have to fight that fight. As I said, my preference is, is that you all fight the fight in Italy, but recognize you've got to change the culture around you. Um, so you have a choice, but recognize it's a choice. And by the way, also recognize 
not on making that decision in your head, that means you've already chosen. Uh, All right. With with that, I hope this was a helpful conversation. It was definitely really helpful and interesting. Um, I really thank both uh, you, Andrea, and uh, Steve, obviously, for being part of this uh, conversation. And it was an amazing chat. I am sure all the viewers also uh, got some really insightful details on both your history and your achievements and what they should do with uh, their lives and uh, their next steps. So uh, thank you again very much. And uh, uh, hopefully we'll be able to talk another time in a similar Great. Hopefully I'll see you in Italy. Yeah, oh, well. <laughs> well, we'll be very happy. Well, we'll thanks a lot, Steve. It was really, it was really a pleasure to see you again.